Hello everyone, Golden Nova here, and this week I'd like to pay back some of the hard work and dedication provided by the mod team on my server. While one of their birthdays is still a ways away, it turns out two of them are very close. So this week, we'll be celebrating them by covering an archetype of their choice. First up is Porcelain, who requested the spell-slinging scholars of La Maison, Prophecy, as well as their associated spellbooks. The cards we're familiar with came out in the 2012 core set, Return of the Duelist, and we seem to be covering a lot of cards from that set, huh? But did you know that a lot of cards not named Prophecy are technically part of that archetype? Their Japanese name, Mado, actually shows up in a ton of cards because it's like the word magical, it gets thrown around a lot as a descriptor. Here's a list of all the examples that I could find, but we're not going to be going over any of them here today, because this theme is big enough as it is, and Guiltia the D-Knight isn't going to get an episode until until a Quasar commander comes around who wants me to, uh, I don't know, sing the names of all the non-effect fusion monsters, whatever. So what do all the real prophecies do? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Let's check the roster to see who's ready for class, double check which spell books they've checked out, then review the curriculum to see how they plan to utilize this forbidden knowledge. It's time to see what's in the cards for prophecy and spell books. But before we continue, a quick reminder to please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed my content so far. You Say Explained is just around the corner, and subscribing is a great way to make sure you don't miss it when it drops. Not to mention it gets us closer to our 30k goal. We've also got our Discord, where people keep posting niche songs from the 80s when no one's looking. I've also got a Twitch where you can join me for viewer duels and progression polls pools, and don't forget about my Patreon, where you can gain access to my videos early, reach some of these milestones, as well as helping to determine which explained video I make. Thank you so much for watching, and now, back to the video. So, what's the deal with prophecies and spellbooks? Well, the former is a series of spellcaster monsters that have a number of effects revolving around the spellbook spell cards, with a focus on Xyz summoning, but has a number of other utility effects. They're also based on the major arcana of a tarot deck, with the TCG names referring to the Rider Waite version, while the OCG names reference the French language tarot deck. No relation to Arcana Force, which I'm also not going to touch unless I'm forced to. It's also one of the more lore-intensive archetypes, being entwined with Endymion and Witchcrafters, and while I'd love to get more into that lore right here, I'm kinda waiting for Majestus to give us a bit more closure before we do. However, if you want to catch up on the story so far, I'll have links down in the doobly-doo where you can find some of the translated information on them that's sourced from official books on the subject. As for the spell books, there are a group of spell cards that reference legendary or groups of books, spanning every subtype that's mechanically general spellcaster support, as well as helping itself, but does work best with prophecy monsters because of how they work together. Let's start by going over the prophecy monsters, and the first one in level order is Stoic of Prophecy, a level 1 water monster with 300 attack and 200 defense, representing the Hanged Man Arcana. When sent to the grave, you can add a level 3 prophecy monster from your deck to your hand, which is a very strange restriction because out of the 15 main deck prophecies, only 5 of them fit this criteria, though thankfully some of those targets are very powerful. There also might be some ulterior motive behind the specificity. Remember earlier when I showed you that list of monsters that are technically prophecy cards based on their OCG name? Well, none of them are level 3, so they don't need to reprint all of them with the parenthetical text to make them retroactively prophecy prophecy monsters. In fact, this may be a case of card design being affected by early translation errors in other regions. Stoic might have been planned to be a more powerful card, but to avoid confusion, they narrowed down the effect. Now, I'm not saying that I'm definitively correct on this, nor am I deriding localization, it's a hard, thankless job. But let's just say I hope I'm wrong, because if I'm not, I'm sure someone got a very stern talking to. Next up is arguably the most famous member of the archetype and the best bridge between the two themes, Spellbook Magician of Prophecy, representing the Magician Arcana. They're a level 2 water monster with 500 attack and 400 defense, and if normal summoned or flipped face up, you can add a Spellbook card from your deck to your hand. This effectively makes them something of a Stratos, which is incredible considering the humongous range of things those cards can do. They also have an activation condition that's incredibly similar to Alistair, and if it's not addressed 
somewhere in canon, this is gonna turn into a book burning very quickly. Amores of Prophecy is a level 3 earth monster with 600 attack and 2000 defense, representing the Lover's Arcana. And once per turn, you can reveal a spellbook card in your hand to special summon a level 4 or lower spellcaster monster from your hand. So this is an example of how some of the prophecies can help with other spellcaster decks to go along with how generic these spellbook spells can be. However, it doesn't help us mobilize our bigger prophecies, and on top of that, they have a terrible archery stance. Definitely do not love that. Fool of Prophecy is a level 3 earth monster with 1600 attack and 900 defense, representing the Fool Arcana. Once per turn, you can send a spellbook spell card from your deck to the grave, and during the end phase of a turn you activated this effect, you can tribute this card to special summon a level 5 or higher dark spellcaster monster from your deck, but this second effect can't be activated or resolved unless you have 5 or more spellbook spell cards in your grave with different names. Boy, this card is... kind of polarizing. I mean, thematically, it's actually really cool. Sending books from your deck to the grave can be like the destruction of knowledge, and even that effect is a foolish burial type effect. And there are a few cards in our theme that we want to have in the grave, or rather that synergize with spellbooks being in the grave. But a once per turn foolish isn't the most impactful thing, especially if we aren't getting the free summon. Now, I know it has that special summoning effect for lore reasons, but what's messed up is that because you can summon any level 5 or higher dark spellcaster monster, you can technically summon the Endemians with this, and that is some huge red flags. Hermit of Prophecy is a level 3 earth monster with 1200 attack and 700 defense, representing the Hermit Arcana. Each time a spellbook spell card is activated, Hermit's level is increased by 2 and attack is increased by 300, both boosts being persistent. Hermit is here to help facilitate RxC's plays, giving us access to rank 3s, 5s, 7s, and maybe even the occasional 9. Well, it better be, because it's certainly not here to be a powerhouse. Even after two triggers, it's only a passable normal summon. But when you sequester yourself away from the card design community like that, you show up with outdated effects like this, what can I say? Justice of Prophecy is a level 3 earth monster with 1600 attack and 800 defense, representing the Justice Arcana. During your end phase, if you activated a spellbook spell card previously this turn, you can banish this card from your field to add both a level 5 or higher light or dark spellcaster monster and a spellbook spell card from your deck to your hand. So they replace the spell you used to trigger this effect, and it sets you up with one of your boss prophecies. A great monster to have alongside other setups, but as a standalone, you're just asking to get OTK'd. But to my understanding, Justice is blind, so it's not like they would know either way. Temperance of Prophecy is a level 3 earth monster with 1000 attack and defense, representing the Temperance Arcana. During your main phase, if you have activated a spellbook spell card previously this turn, you can tribute this card to special summon a level 5 or higher light or dark spellcaster monster from your deck, but you can't special summon another level 5 or higher monster during the turn you activate this effect. This is probably my favorite of the tributing prophecies, as it gets you the monster immediately with little upfront investment, but its restriction is tricky. It doesn't discern between before or after, so if you special summon a level 5 or higher monster before you use Temperance's effect, then you won't be able to activate it at all. But if you get the right monster with this, your opponent's gonna be toast. Charioteer of Prophecy is a level 4 wind monster with 1800 attack and 1300 defense, representing the Chariot Arcana. Once per turn, you can discard a spellbook spell card to target any spellcaster monster in your grave and add that target to your hand. So if you need to gain access to Magician again, any of your tribute prophecies, or put any of your extra deck spellcaster monsters back into your extra deck, Chariot's got your back, jockeying you into a better position. Strength of Prophecy is a level 4 fire monster with 1500 attack and 4 1400 defense, representing the Strength Arcana. Once per turn, you can shuffle a spellbook spell card from your grave into your deck to target a face-up spellcaster monster on the field and increase its level by 1 and attack by 500, both of which being persistent boosts. Much like Hermit, Strength is here to help modulate levels for XC summoning, but unlike Hermit, can turn one of your normal summons into a complete house. Even triggering its effect on itself turns it into a 2000 attack beat stick. It even recycles spellbooks, though Honestly, that's less spellbooks in Grave that can be recycled or banished for other effects we have, and that's just rude. They really put an axe to our other plans. 
Emperor of Prophecy is a level 5 dark monster with 2300 attack and 2000 defense, representing the Emperor Arcana. They can banish both one face-up spellcaster you control, except this card, and a spellbook card from your grave to target a face-up monster your opponent controls and take control of it until the end of phase. But Emperor can't attack the turn you activate this effect. I guess they were too afraid of making an archetypal change of heart effect without a drawback, huh? Well, at least it's better now than it's ever been. Previously, what you take would have to have a good effect you'd want to use, or a level that matches up for Synchro or Xyz summons. But now that links exist, anything can be used as material, especially now that we have Dark the Dark Charmer Gloomy. And to be fair, you'd be pretty gloomy too if you used someone like this as link material, because Emperor looks sour. Prophecy Destroyer is a level 6 dark monster with 2500 attack and 1200 defense, representing the Devil Arcana. If this card is in your grave, you can banish 3 spellbook spell cards from your grave to special summon this card from your grave. Well, not free, that is banishing a lot of spellbooks, and its level doesn't really line up with our others for Xyz summoning, uh, so it's just a big jerk that can also set you up for Beatrice plays. And despite the name, it's still part of the team. It's not like opposed to the prophecies, which makes it really confusing now with the whole War with Endymion storyline going on, and honestly, I expect more from the lore team when it comes to maintaining the consistency of lore among cards that are almost a decade old, when this storyline wasn't even planned. For shame. Making their second appearance in this video, Reaper of Prophecy is a level 6 dark monster with 2000 attack and 1600 defense, representing the Death Arcana. When normal or special summoned, you can activate an effect that applies as many of the following as possible based on the number of spellbook spell cards with different names in your grave. If you have 3 or more, this card gains 600 attack. With 4 or more, you can add a spellbook spell card from your deck to your hand. And with 5 or more, you special summon a level 5 or higher dark spellcaster monster from your deck. So if you summoned Reaper off the effect of Fool, you'll get all 3, ending on quite the impressive monster. You can keep the 2600 attack alongside another big spellcaster, and if you summon a level 6, perhaps destroyer, you've set yourself up to perform an Xyz summon. And either way, you get yourself a spellbook for your troubles. Though if you do summon them by Fool's Effect, you won't get to effectively use any of them until your next turn rolls around, so being a late game payoff from another summon effect is how you can get this Reaper into high spirits. High Priestess of Prophecy is a level 7 light monster with 2500 attack and 2100 defense, representing the High Priestess Arcana and is only one attribute off from having Dark Magician stats. You can reveal 3 spellbook spell cards in your hand to special summon this card from your hand, though they aren't restricted from being summoned in other ways. And once per turn you can banish a spellbook spell card from your hand or grave, then target a card on the field and destroy it. So it's like a mini Dark Armed Dragon that takes advantage of all the spellbooks you've played and can even be a free summon if your hand is clogged with them. It really is true what they say. Reading really is a gateway to dismantling your opponent's board one card at a time. Wheel of Prophecy is a Leomon looking son of a gun that's a level 8 dark spellcaster monster with 2700 attack and 1700 defense, representing the Wheel of Fortune Arcana. When special summoned by the effect of a spellcaster monster, you can target any number of your banished spellbook spell cards, shuffle them into your deck, and if you do, return your other banished spellbook spell cards to your grave. So now you have a way to get back all those used books, and its flexibility can set up a number of different cards. Whether you want more cards to banish from your grave for High Priestess or Destroyer, or set up Reaper or Fool's Effect, you can return the books however way works best for you. But because it doesn't do anything on its own, and its activation trigger is pretty picky, it actually doesn't see much play. So much like this monster's Digimon counterpart, their prospects are looking pretty dead. Our last main deck monster and making their third appearance in this video is World of Prophecy, a level 9 light monster with 2900 attack and 2400 defense, representing the World Arcana. When this card is special summoned by the effect of a spellcaster monster or a spellbook spell card, you can target two spellbook spell cards in your grave, add those targets to your hand, and you can't special summon other monsters the turn you activate this effect, so you better make it count. And when you add any number of cards to your hand by that effect, you can reveal four spellbook spell cards with different names in your hand to destroy all other cards on the field. That's right, a big ol' board wipe. And because of the trigger conditions, you'll have plenty of spellbooks to rebuild your own field and take over the duel. Though, of course, you're gonna have to wait until a later turn to stock up on monsters. It's a great equalizer to summon off your tribute prophecies if you've got the right setup, but otherwise it's not really gonna rock your world. 
Now it's time for our extra deck monsters. Empress of Prophecy is a rank 5 light monster with 2000 attack and 1700 defense, requiring two level 5 spellcaster monsters as material, representing the Empress Arcana. This card gains 300 attack for each Xyz material attached to a monster you control, and once per turn, you can attach an Xyz material from this card to shuffle your deck, then excavate the top 5 cards of your deck, and destroy monsters on the field up to the number of spellbook cards excavated. Also after that, place the excavated cards on top of your deck in any order. So the more Xyz monsters you make, the more potential attack you give Empress, and they can non-targeting pop several monsters on the board at once, kinda like a prototype Risen Dragite. But unlike that big blue friend, there's no way to actually set up this effect, so there's a lot more chance involved in getting those pops. But you always get to know the top 5 of your deck afterwards, so you know what to prepare for. Along with your opponent, because that's how excavating works. You know, I thought we were supposed to be the know-it-all deck, why are we just giving away knowledge like this? Hierophant of Prophecy is a rank 7 dark monster with 2800 attack and 2600 defense, requiring two level 7 spellcaster monsters as material, representing the Hierophant Arcana. Once per turn, you can detach an Xyz material from this card to destroy spell and trap cards your opponent controls up to the number of spellbook spell cards in your grave. So it's a Harpy's Feather Duster, but its power is variable depending on how many spellbooks you've churned through. I feel like this must have been a product of a time where back row removal was at a premium, but boy, nowadays this Emerald Ord Hierophant isn't making much of a splash. Our last extra deck monster isn't a prophecy per se, but it might as well be. And it's not even an Xyz, but a Link monster. Crowley, the first Prophesier, is a Link 2 Dark monster with a thousand attack, requiring two spellcaster monsters as material, representing the Thoth tarot deck, one that was painted by Lady Frida Harris. On the instructions of Alistair Crowley, the references just keep coming. If Link summoned, you can reveal three spellbook cards with different names from your deck, and your opponent randomly picks one to add to your hand. Also shuffle the rest into your deck. And each turn, you can normal summon a level 5 or higher spellcaster monster without tributing. So now we can field all of our higher level prophecies in our hand, though this doesn't really help with the wheel and world. And if you're running another high level spellcaster deck, say something like Dark Magician, this can also be an asset. The fact that the spellbook add is random is pretty frustrating, but since you can search three cards that in turn search other cards, it's not that bad. But mark my words, we're gonna get a spell book that Fusion summons one of these days, and it's gonna be all Crowley's fault. Alright, we're done with our Prophecy Monsters, now it's time for our Spellbook Spells. Spellbook of Secrets is a normal spell that represents Grimoires, and adds any Spellbook card from our deck to our hand, except another copy of itself. This means that they can turn into any one of our other spells, as well as Spellbook Magician of Prophecy, which is itself a Spellbook card. So you've got a Searcher that searches a Searcher, how cute! It's like a little Sky Striker engage! Actually... Now that I think about it, it is kind of messed up that the Warrior Machine deck is better at casting spells than the Spell Caster theme. Spellbook of Power is a normal spell that represents the Hygromantea and targets a spellcaster monster you control, giving it a 1000 attack boost that turn. And if it does, each time it destroys a monster by battle, you can add a Spellbook spell card from your deck to your hand. So it's kind of like Secrets, with the added caveat that you steamroll a monster, which ain't bad. A lot of our normal summonable prophecies could use the power boost, so getting to add offensive pressure to our searches is a neat trick that, because of its lingering effect, doesn't care if the prophecy monster has its effects negated. Now that's the power of a good book. Spellbook of Knowledge is a normal spell that represents the Galdra Book, and has you sending either a spellcaster you control or another spellbook card from your hand or face-up field to the grave, except a copy of itself, and if you do, draw two cards. Since this is all effect and no cost, you're not gonna get two for one if this gets negated, and will trigger any effect that requires a spellcaster to be sent to grave via card effect, namely Shadal's. For a time, this was a popular draw engine in any deck that wasn't too picky about its normal summon, because because instead of searching secrets with a normal summoned magician, you could search knowledge, send a blue boy to the grave, and draw two fresh cards, all as a plus one. And of course, in archetype, this is a great way to just filter cards, brought upon by the combined power of sword, rod, shield, and cups. 
Spellbook of Eternity is a normal spell that represents almanacs, and targets one of your banished spellbook spell cards, except a copy of itself, and adds it to your hand. We've had a lot of cards that banish spellbooks so far, and spoilers, we haven't seen the last of them. So Eternity is a great way to make sure your resource loop goes on for... well... forever. And speaking of recurring banished cards, Spellbook of Miracles is a normal spell that targets a Spellcaster Xyz monster in your grave and up to two banished Spellbook spell cards to special summon the targeted monster, and if you do, attach the targeted Spellbook spell cards to it as Xyz material. So now you can go back to popping back row with Hierophant, hoping for a lucky hit off of Empress, or stealing a monster with Big Eye. It's unlikely that any of these monsters can really turn the tide of battle all on their own, but these kind of recursion effects are the kind of thing that miracles are made of. Spellbook Library of the Crescent is a normal spell that also represents one of the Tarot Arcana, this one being the Moon. You can only activate it if you have no Spellbook spell cards in your grave. You reveal three Spellbook spell cards with different names from your deck, your opponent randomly selects one to add to your hand, and the rest are shuffled into your deck, so it works pretty much like Crowley. And you can only activate Spellbook spell cards the turn you activate Crescent. This makes for a great card to see in your opening hand, or a search off of Magician if you already have secrets ready to go. But because of its own restriction, it's not going to see much play beyond turn one until you empty out your grave. And once again, the lingering restriction checks for before and after you use Crescent, so no trying to be cheeky and use Upstart Goblin to draw into this. And honestly, that's why I don't really go to the Crescent Library anymore. All these rules and regulations and you don't even get to check out the book you want. No wonder Yu-Gi-Oh players have trouble reading, our educational systems are run by bureaucrats! Spellbook Library of the Heliosphere is a normal spell that represents the Sun Arcana, and can only be activated if you have five or more Spellbook spell cards in your grave. You excavate the top two cards of your deck, and add any excavated Spellbook spell cards from among them to your hand. Also shuffle the other cards into your deck, and you also can't activate spell cards the turn you activate Heliosphere, except Spellbook cards. This here is an even chancier effect than Crescent. At least with the Moon you have a 1 in 3 chance of getting what you want, and it guarantees you'd get something, but with Sun, your odds are up against your entire deck. Thankfully, Empress of Prophecy can help with this, because after using their second effect, you can rearrange the top five cards of your deck to your liking. Using Heliosphere will randomize things after you resolve it, but you'll be able to float two spellbooks to the top of your deck and go plus one. And you can actually play this later on in the game, since you won't have to worry about dumping spells into your banished zone. You just have to make sure you don't... use many of the effects that require that, of which we have a few good ones. Hmm. I'm starting to think this place is getting a bit too self-important for its own good. It takes way too much work to use effectively, yet it acts like the entire archetype revolves around it. Spellbook of the Master is a normal spell that represents the safer Yetzira, and can only be activated if you control a spellcaster monster. You reveal one other spellbook card in your hand, then target a spellbook normal spell card in your grave, and Master's effect becomes that target's effect. Now, this is one of the trickiest and coolest cards in the whole archetype. For the most part, our spellbooks come with a hard once per turn clause. Master upends that by copying one of those effects. So you could, in essence, get a second secret search, a second boost off of power which does cause a double search if put on the same monster, or get back a second banished card with Eternity. It also bypasses activation requirements, so you can use both libraries regardless of the amount of spellbooks in your grave, though it will still apply the spell lockout. This is one of the greatest cards in the whole theme, hands down, but I would like to point out the symbol on the book. True, the Sefir Yetzirah is a Jewish text, so having the Sephirot on it makes sense. But you know what else emulates the Sephirot? Clifforts. See, this is what happens when you throw religious iconography around willy-nilly. I'm gonna start roping prophecy into dual terminal lore, is that what you want, Konami? Spellbook of Fate is a quick play spell that represents the Goetia, and can only be activated if you control a spellcaster monster. You can banish up to three spellbook spell cards from your grave, and apply one of the following effects, depending on the number of spell cards banished. With one, you return a set speller trap card to their owner's hand. Two, you change a monster on the field to face down defense position or face up attack position. Or with three, you banish a card your opponent controls. And none of these effects target, so once you commit to how many spellbooks you banish, 
your opponent's gonna have to think fast. The sheer versatility of this card is what makes it so terrifying, as it's basically a one-size-fits-all problem solver for anything at almost any time and having non-targeting removal, or even suppression in the form of turning a monster face down, is effective against even some of the strongest monsters that see play nowadays. So no matter what the format has in store for you, you've got the tools to bend fate to your will. Spellbook of Wisdom is a quick play spell that represents the Torah, and targets a spellcaster on the field to activate one of two effects. It either becomes unaffected by other spell effects this turn, or is unaffected by trap effects this turn. This effectively keeps one of your monsters safe from a form of non-monster interaction, be it Raigeki, Lightning Storm, Infinite Impermanence, it can even blunt the effect of Forbidden Droplets, as long as your opponent doesn't discard a spell as part of the cost. And since this works on spellcasters in general, you can use this in decks like Witchcrafter, or again, Dark Magician, to help you push through effects while your opponent is none the wiser. Spellbook Organization is a quick play spell that was made long before this archetype became a thing, and if you're a Yugi boomer like me, you may recognize this card as previously being named Pigeonholing Books of Spell, so no legendary book references here. Its effect is also very simple, you get to peek at the top three cards of your deck and rearrange them as you see fit. Nifty for some fun interactions with cards like Archfiend's Oath and the True Name, but is otherwise unremarkable. I remember thinking the card's name was Pigeonholing's Book of Spells, like there was a character out there named the Great Wizard Pigeonholing, and I really hope this ends up being a card one day, because that'd be one of the silliest references ever. It's at this point we're going to be talking about the most busted card in the theme, Spellbook of Judgment. During the end phase of a turn this card was activated, you add Spellbook spell cards from your deck to your hand, except another copy of itself, up to the number of spell cards activated after this card's resolution. Then you can special summon from your deck a Spellcaster monster whose level is less than or equal to the number of cards added to your hand by this effect. Goodness gracious. Gracious. So every card you play after Judgment Resolves gets replaced at the end of the turn, so all your minus ones even out, the cards that even out are plus ones, and anything bigger than that just passes that value along. And by the end of it, you get a bigger and bigger spellcaster, depending on how far you were able to pop off. It even counts generic spells towards that count too, which is ridiculous. While getting something like World is a little unreasonable, activating 9 spells in a turn is something reserved for Sky Strikers after all, there are still a lot of wonderful choices, which has secured Judgment's place on the ban list for some time now. It's even part of the reason why Sky Striker Mecha Module's multi-role is on the limited list, because it's generally the same card, but with different flavor, getting you back Striker spells based on how many you played that turn. And that card triggers at the end of every turn. And honestly, I hope both those cards stay right where they are, because seeing an opponent go full combo, then replenish all their resources after the fact is demoralizing. I'm not normally a judgy person, but this is a bridge too far. Spellbook Star Hall is a continuous spell that represents the Star Arcana. It gains a spell counter each time a Spellbook spell card is activated, and all spellcasters you control gain 100 attack for each spell counter on this card. And when this card with spell counters on it is destroyed and sent to the grave, you can add a spellcaster monster from your deck to your hand, whose level is less than or equal to the number of spell counters that were on Star Hall. So this helps to shore up the middling stats of our lower leveled prophecies, and makes our bigger ones genuine combat threats all while floating into another card if your opponent MSTs it. Though with the prevalence of Cosmic Cyclone and Non-Destruction Removal, this will likely see a lot less activations, especially because it misses timing for some reason. These magicians may be smart, but it looks like they skipped over PSCT 101. Spellbook of Life is an equipped spell that represents the Necronomicon. You banish a Spellcaster monster from your grave and reveal another Spellbook card in your hand. You banish a Spellcaster monster from your grave and reveal one other Spellbook spell card in your hand to target a Spellcaster monster in your grave and special summon that target in face-up attack position, equipping it with this card. And the equipped monster gains levels equal to the level of the monster banished for this card's activation. This can help line up your levels for an Xyz summon, but funny thing, this is one of those premature burial-esque effects that does not destroy the equipped monster when removed from the field. If your opponent gets rid of life after resolution, all it will do is remove the increased levels, which I think is pretty nifty. It even means it synergizes with world because it's not going to blow itself up as well. But 
Now you've got to answer something, Konami. I let the Cliffort thing slide, but what is Divine Grace North Wemco doing here? It can't just be that they're a generic spellcaster, that's too easy. I I is Garlandolf around here too? Do they have a connection with Demise and Ruin? And if so, to what extent? And the Jin monsters, you have got to stop doing this to me, Konami! The Grand Spellbook Tower is a field spell that represents the Tower Arcana. Once per turn during your standby phase, if you have a spellcaster monster on your side of the field or grave, you can place a spellbook spell card from your grave on the bottom of your deck, accept a copy of this card, then draw a card, basically giving you two draws per turn while recycling your important spells. And when this card in your possession is destroyed by your opponent's card and sent to the grave, you can special summon a spellcaster monster from your hand or deck whose total level is less than or equal to the number of spellbook spell cards in your grave. So you have a sweet draw engine that punishes your opponent if they try to remove it by destruction, but it also misses timing. Who constructed these things? Anyway, it's a maddeningly powerful card in the grind game. If you recycle Eternity with this, you'll always have a means to get back your banished spellbooks, all while increasing your card advantage so it towers over your opponent. Lastly, we have a couple of traps to cover on technicalities. Hidden Spellbook is a normal trap that can only be used on your turn, and targets two spell cards in your grave and shuffles those targets into your deck. It's an emergency recycler, but can't be used in response to grave hate on your opponent's turn because of that very inconvenient activation window. And Towers does the same thing, which is slower, but doesn't waste a card and draws you a card every turn. If it's hidden away in your bulk, that's where it should stay. And our last card is the Transmigration Prophecy. Eh? Eh? Like I said, it's technically a Prophecy card, but doesn't have any real synergy with the deck. Though the Transmigration Prophecy did see some competitive play as a kind of DD Crow, scrubbing cards out of your opponent's grave at quick effect speed so they couldn't access them while also having the flexibility of returning cards from your grave to your own deck in case recycling the card could lead to other combos. Which is Probably why it's currently an SR in Master Duel, um, I have no idea why it's that rarity today, but I'm just a little guy, what do I know? Alright, so that's all the Spellbook and Prophecy cards, but what do we do with them? Well, with all the card selection and interaction we have, we're firmly in the control camp. Which isn't to say we can't turn the corner and do a lot of damage out of nowhere, but we'll be building up our resources first, stocking up our library shelves with all of our opponent's weaknesses, before exploiting them in the most efficient and logical way. But what can we play to help them out? Well, as it turns out, most spellcasters don't really fit into prophecies and spellbooks the way these themes can be splashed into others. For instance, any high-leveled spellcaster we'd want to normal summon for free off of Crowley's effect can't be normal summoned at all. Magistus kind of operate on their own frequency, and while they do have generic spellcaster effects, many of them delineate between level 4 and lower, as well as level 4 and higher. And that sweet spot of level 4 is not really filled with very powerful prophecies. And Witchcrafter are also very focused on their own archetype. The closest thing that we could play them with is Endymion, because they love C spell card activate to make counter go up, but the current Pendulum version of the deck already does a great job of making sure you have all the spell counters you need. But one generically good card that can help us out is Palladium Oracle Mana. It doesn't protect our Xyz monsters, or any of our lower leveled prophecies, but it is free link material when it triggers. And if you splash in a Dark Magician Girl or two, then all the better. Witchcrafter Golem Aruru can also help your monsters from being destroyed in battle by bouncing the aggressor back to the hand, or enacting some retaliation if said monsters get targeted by effects. But a monster that's really funny to play is Jaugen the Spiritualist. Though you can't summon it for free off of a Judgment Resolution, at time of recording, you can still make it fairly beefy with the buffs from Spellbook Star Hall, as well as keeping it safe with cards like Wisdom and Fate. It answers a whole board of special summoned monsters, and if you ever want to start spitting monsters onto the board again, you can always send it to the grave with knowledge, draw two, special summon to your heart's content, then bring back Jaugen with Spellbook of Life. Floodgates can also help make our control game much easier. Goes in match, and there can be only one, are anathema to us, but we can make effective use of Rivalry of Warlords and Summon Limit, 
it should the format support that. As for a silly tech pick, as an extension of the previous point, Skill Drain was just removed from the Forbidden and Limited list altogether, giving you a full three copies to work with. Now, it may seem weird that the spell deck is benefiting so much from a trap card, and while we do end up shutting off our own monster effects with it as well, if we need to push an effect through, we can chain Wisdom to our monster's effect selecting trap cards, or chain Fate, banishing two to flip down our monster, and voila! You get to use a monster effect under Skill Drain. And with the rest of our strategy coming from spell card activations, we'll have a grand time picking apart what's left of our opponent's strategy with Fate, while keeping our cards stocked up with tower. And that's all I've got to say about Prophecy and Spellbook. If you like Sky Striker, then you'll find a lot to love here. Spell cards have been rendered down to essential staples in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! for a long time now, so it's nice to see a theme that has spells as a key part of its identity. If you practice enough, you might find that it's even got some tricks that will throw modern decks for a loop. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go camp outside of Yu-Gi-Oh! R&D in protest until they release the rest of the Magistus cards so I can find out what in the blazes is going on here. But for now, I want to hear what you all have to say. Do you think that spell books and prophecies are a real page turner? Or is their strategy out of print? Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, please make sure to like this video to show your support, subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and share this video with someone you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode was brought to you by my lovely patrons, including this month's illustrious Quasar Commander, Adam Zajdel, Nebula Navigators, Benjamin Meisner, Eric, Genesis Yu-Gi-Oh!, Gloomba331, Howling Zangetsu, John Manji, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, Shooting Star 3300, Sun Sorrow, The Fresh Prince of Conair, The Wizard Moose and Xander Wolfensberger, Cosmic Crusaders, Bear Sharktopus Studios, Serb, Chaz Ghost, Colin Todd, Corbinisms, Cozy Boat 275, Jesus Garcia, Manga Pages, RGS and the Legendary Raven, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you'd like to be a part of these credits, as well as help me in my journey to cover all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s archetypes, as well as help me keep this as my day job, please check out my YouTube membership or Patreon links in the description to see if I have anything you'd like on offer. And if you want to see me talk about another deck that's known for slinging spells, check out this video I did covering Sky Strikers. And if you want to see two yu gi tubers going at it, check out Noah Jenk and I's latest series, Progression Polls, where your voice shapes the format. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.